Well, the message for today is entitled, Asa, the Wholehearted King. And I've told you the passage of Scripture that we're, that we're at least going to start with, 1 Kings 15, 8 through 14. This is part of our sermon series entitled, Good King, Bad King, where we're looking at all the kings of Israel in the Bible, in the northern kingdom and southern kingdom, both good and bad. We can learn character lessons from their lives. The good kings can teach us biblical qualities to emulate, and the bad kings can kind of flash warning lights over character flaws that we need to avoid in our lives. Last week, we looked at King Abijah. If you remember, he was Abijah the half-hearted king. And we read the sad verse in 1 Kings 15, 3 that stated, his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. What a sad statement. But in our scripture today, his son, King Asa, had a heart that was, quote, fully committed to the Lord in 1 Kings 15, 14. And you can read about this wholehearted King Asa beginning in verse 8 of that chapter of 1 Kings chapter 15. Now, I want to talk about characters of a wholehearted person, a person who is fully devoted to God. And the first thing I want you to notice about people who are all in for God is this. First of all, people fully devoted to God pursue the truth. People fully devoted to God pursue the truth. Reading in 1 Kings chapter 15, beginning with verse 11, Asa, King Asa, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his forefather David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all of the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother, Maacah, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Remember King Asa's dad, the half-hearted King Abijah, had allowed all kinds of horrible, evil, false religions in the land. I told you last week about Molech and the infant sacrifice that he allowed. And then today we read about these male shrine prostitutes that were part of another evil false religion. And, and, and it was just, just horrible, immoral, violent, perverse religions that were allowed in the nation of Judah. Asa's own grandmother, Mayaka, was an idol worshiper who set up what the Bible calls a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. But Asa, this wholehearted king, pursued the truth and desired the true God with his whole heart. So he got rid of these terrible false idols and these violent, perverted religious practices. Why did he do it? Because wholehearted people pursue the true God and pursue the truth of God. Wholehearted people pursue the truth. Now, the next thing I want you to notice about wholehearted people, and this is possibly the most important thing that I say today, is this. Fully devoted people to God are not perfect. People fully devoted to God are not necessarily perfect. Look down at verse 14 where the Bible states, although he did not remove the high places, in other words, he didn't remove all of the high places. He left some of them. He left his job undone in removing all these false religions. Although he did not remove the high places, note this, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. So what do you know about that? Asa wasn't perfect, and we know that. People aren't perfect. We're all, we're all sinful. There were some things that he left undone. Also, later in this message, you'll find out that he had a problem with anger and bitterness. But notice here in the Bible, something very important. You don't have to be perfect to be called wholehearted by God. And this is very important for you to know. Because I imagine that many people, when they think of being wholehearted to God and being sold out for Jesus, I bet some people, in their own mind, they set the bar so high for that, so high that they think, I could never do that, and then they relieve themselves of any responsibility to really go after it in their spiritual life. 
They set the, whole, the bar so high they relieve themselves of any responsibility even to pursue the goal of knowing God with their whole heart. Oh, I could never be that devoted, they say. I could never reach that level of courage and commitment and perfection. And then that just gives them a pass and they just, they just give up and go their own way. Living a mediocre, lukewarm spiritual life like Abijah last week. Just a, just a half-hearted, ho-hum, feckless, useless spiritual existence. But South Main family, this should not be. We should be fully devoted to the Lord. And don't let that lofty goal of being wholehearted for the Lord give you an excuse not to even try no, the goal of wholeheartedness should not discourage us. It should inspire us to reach farther than we ever have in our pursuit of God. Asa is the example we should follow, not Abijah last week. And Asa was wholehearted not because he was perfect. He wasn't. But because of the perfect God that he pursued with sincerity and commitment and zeal. So quit saying, oh, I could never be great for God. Get up and get in the game of fully being devoted to the Lord your God. Next, um, why be wholehearted anyway? The reason is this next point. Because fully devoted people to God enjoy God's blessings. Enjoy God's blessings. The account of King Asa encompasses five chapters in the Bible and many more chapters touch on his life. And all of the accounts of him have one thing in common. They all report that God blessed him. God blessed him. For example, in 2 Chronicles 14, if you'll turn there, beginning with verse 2, we read that Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah. And look here. And the kingdom was at peace under him. In verse 6, he built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers and gates and bars. The land is still ours, because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. And look at this last phrase. So they built and prospered. Folks, if you give your whole heart to God, if you put him first in your life, then you give God the lordship over every area of your life. And when God is lord over an area, he blesses it. God will take that lordship that you give him and he will bless your life. And folks, I'm sorry if I sound like an abundant life preacher at this point, but it's a fact that wholehearted people enjoy God's blessings. And if you don't believe me, try it. Be all in for the Lord and see if he does not bless you in unique and wonderful ways. Now, I don't know what specific ways God will manifest his blessing to you. But take God at his word. Pursue him with your whole heart. And you, according to the scripture, will experience blessing. The Bible reports that King Asa was wholehearted for the Lord. And the result that followed was, quote, the kingdom was at peace under him and also that the kingdom built and prospered under this all-in king. Now, the third thing. Another thing we learn from King Asa's full devotion to the Lord is this. People fully devoted to God believe in powerful prayer. People fully devoted to God believe in powerful prayer to the Lord and they experience powerful results from the Lord. In 2 Chronicles chapter 14, we read about an enemy called Zerah the Cushite that was, that was threatening 
the kingdom of Judah. Oh, they posed an existential threat to the kingdom of Judah. This was a huge army, technologically advanced, and they were about to make Judah their next domino in their, in their quest for world domination. Zerah the Cushite. Reading in verse 9 of 2 Chronicles 14, Zerah the Cushite marched out against them with an army of thousands upon thousands and 300 chariots and came as far as Merishah. Asa went out to meet him and they took up battle positions in the valley of Zephathah near Merishah. Then King Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help this powerful the, help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Let not mere mortals prevail against you. And then reading down in verse 12. Then the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. Such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. Folks, learn to pray to this miracle working God. Oh, this enemy was insurmountable. Thousands upon thousands of troops. They were militarily advanced. If you had horses and chariots, you were just, uh, you were just unstoppable. But Asa prayed to the Lord his God. Folks, you need to believe in prayer for the enemies that prevail against you. Some of you are suffering now with physical illness. Others of you are suffering with relational problems in your family. Some of you are suffering financial disaster. Some of you are suffering in ways that I cannot even uh, imagine. You've got enemies surrounding you. But Asa called to the Lord his God. He believed in powerful prayer. And he experienced powerful results in his prayers. Folks, learn to pray. How do you learn to pray? You pray. The disciples in Luke 11, 1 said, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to pray. We know how to pray. We need the Lord to teach us to pray. In season and out of season. In good times and bad times. Even when enemies threaten. Lord, teach us to pray. All right, next. Fully devoted people detest false worship. People fully devoted to God detest false worship. Reading in 2 Chronicles 15, we read the words of the prophet Azariah when he told Asa in verse 2, The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now skipping to verse 7. But as for you, be strong and do not give up. For your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. And look at this. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. He hated False worship. He hated false worship. He got rid of these false and detestable and violent and perverted religious practices. And look, look at what had happened. The altar of the Lord at the temple was in such disrepair that it had fallen apart. So he goes and he repairs the temple of the true God of Israel. Asa stood against the false worship of these detestable idols. And then in verse 9, we see him now repairing the altar of the Lord. And now we see him reinstituting the sincere worship of the true God of Israel. And that's our next point. You see, people fully devoted to God love true worship. People fully devoted to God love true worship. Reading in verse 9, then he assembled all of Judah and Benjamin. But then you notice... There were some other people from some other tribes that were coming as well who joined them. You see, true worship is attractive. It, 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 it involves other people. It, it, it attracts other people from other tribes, other nations, other tongues. 
And, and then look at verse 9. Then the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, Simeon, who had settled among him, large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. And then skipping down to verse 12, they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all of their heart and soul. You see, Asa's wholeheartedness was contagious, and now everybody was, was seeking the Lord with their whole heart and soul. Different tribes, different tongues, worshiping the true God together. What a novel idea. Folks, People, churches are always trying to attract people. Like today, we had donuts in Sunday school. So, you know, we're hoping a donut helps us to have high attendance day in worship service. And I know I came for that, you know, and I know you probably did too. So donuts, you know, food. And, and sometimes you have relevant worship, you know, the, the 830 service with the band and then the 11 o'clock service with the choir and the orchestra. So good music and good food and, and great signage and a beautiful building. And we want to attract people. Why? so that they can come here about Jesus and be saved. So how many of you want to attract people to Christ? Just raise your hand if you want to attract people to Christ. Man, I know I do. My hands come up. You know the greatest way to attract people, according to this Bible verse? Learn to worship. Learn to worship. Worship the Lord with your whole heart. Next Sunday, if we worship God with our whole heart, we won't be able to keep people out of these doors True worship attracts people, and that's what happened. These other tribes, these other tongues, Asa was restoring true worship, and they came, and they worshiped, and the Bible says they worshiped with all of their heart and soul. So notice that people fully devoted to God worship the true God in any style or language. They don't care. Whatever style it is, whatever language it is, whatever culture it is, whatever race, whatever tribe, whatever tongue, if people are on God's side, we're on their side, we're worshiping together. Folks, if you've ever really worshiped, you don't care what style it was in. You don't care what language it was in. If Jesus is being honored and glorified, you don't sit back saying, oh, what a great sermon. Oh, what great singing. Oh, what a great style. You're saying, oh, what a great Savior. Oh, what a great Savior. Worship is what attracts people. That's why so many churches are so dead. That's why there's just a desert spiritually in our land because we need to reclaim true worship. Now, there's a big issue in churches today that some call the worship wars. I'm thankful our church, for some reason, has never had the worship wars. And you know what that is? It's a term that applies to a lot of churches that are experiencing conflict over worship styles. In many churches, the traditionalists don't like the contemporary worship styles with all of the informality and the band and the lights and the drums. Conversely, the contemporary worship folks in many services criticize what they call the dead and formal worship with organs and choirs. Here at South Main, I don't know why it is. We have never had those worship wars. Maybe it's because of those huge youth choirs we had 30 and 40 years ago. That, that broke that barrier before any other church did. But I'm thankful we've never really had this conflict. I'll never forget one day, remember a few months ago when the band played at the 11 o'clock service. You know the band from the 830 service. The, it was loud and the guitars and the drums and the band was just weird like they usually are. And so after the service, then the band played there. Everybody loved it in the 11 o'clock service. No worship wars. So I went up to one of our oldest members here at the church, I ended up one of her, oh, this man, I asked him, I asked her what she thought about it. And she smiled and she said, well, she said, well, it wasn't my cup of tea. But I truly enjoyed seeing all those young people up there praising the Lord. You see, that's an attitude of a wholehearted Christian. Wholehearted Christians just love true worship. Just love true worship. And in the coming days, we're all going to get older and older and older. And one day, you might just hear a godly younger pastor stand up before you, and you might hear this godly younger pastor ask you to help him build a church that you may not like, but your grandchildren will like it. And you're going to get behind him 100%, just like you've done me and just like you've done every pastor before you. Why? Because wholehearted Christians do that. Wholehearted Christians like true worship, and they don't care what style it is, as long as people are coming to Christ. And folks, I'm not just preaching to the older people either. At the 8.30 service, I preach to the younger people. 
And I told him, look, I've never seen our older members roll their eyes in judgment or superiority when the band plays. And so likewise, younger people, don't roll your eyes or make fun of the organ or piano or orchestra or a traditional solo like you're something because we're nothing when we're worshiping. It's just God is everything. So folks, just learn to worship the Lord and enjoy the Lord no matter what the style. Just rear back and worship him. And the Bible says we can't keep people away from a worshiping church. Rear back and just worship, whether it's the choir or the orchestra or the band or a southern gospel group or Latino music or black gospel. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And wholehearted Christians go after it in worship. No matter what the culture, that's what missions is all about. Well, I was stretched one day. I was with the North American Mission Board. I used to be the director of event evangelism. It was one of the things that was my assignment there at North American Mission Board. It was one of my responsibilities. And one day we were having a big simultaneous evangelistic and outreach events all over Atlanta one day. We called it Crossover Atlanta. One of the events was a big block party, which was a big cookout with a concert, an outdoor kind of event that we had in an area of Atlanta called Little Five Points. How many of you are familiar with Little Five Points in Atlanta? All right, Little Five Points in Atlanta is that, every big city has these, but it's that eclectic, bohemian area of the city. It's the area with all the vegan sandwich shops and the occult bookstores and the tie-dyed t-shirt shops and the fortune tellers and the head shops that sell all manner of drug paraphernalia. It's Little Five Point. At least back then, that's what it was like. I once gave... Directions to Little Five Points like this. Exit from Interstate I-20 on Moreland Avenue. Drive north on Moreland Avenue for a few miles until it looks like you're in the middle of a Grateful Dead concert. That's Little Five Points. You'll know you're there. Anyway, our block party was well attended. Outdoor event, we just had a little, they had a little green space there in Little Five Points. We got permitted from the city. We set up this, we set up... Grilled chicken, beans and rice cooking. We gave a free marked Bible to every person we met. But the real key to our success was this band that we found. I don't even remember the name of this Christian heavy metal band. But we asked them to come. We just thought they'd be perfect for little five points. And they were. They came and and they were perfect. They walked up with a big smile, big hair, leather pants, military boots, Black eyeliner, and those were the guys, okay? That's not even the girls, all right? And, uh, and they were very sweet Christians. They were very sweet Christians. And then they started playing, and it was loud, and they were all over the stage. I mean, it was something that I had never heard before. One of our volunteers at this block party, a middle-aged soccer grandmom, walked over during the event and said, Toby, the noise that they're making is horrendous. I do not like this at all. And I calmly replied, replied, ma'am, with all due respect, they're not trying to reach you. Those headbangers over there, they seem to like the music. And she said, that's right. I'm already reached. They're not trying to reach me. Folks, We had over 300 people saved that day at Crossover Atlanta. You see, devoted people welcome true worship. Whatever style it is, if it honors the Lord. Folks, music style, it's really not a taste issue. It's a language issue. That band was sharing the gospel in the language of that group. And and they took those Bibles and and they came to Christ. The next thing... I want you to notice, and this kind of goes along with that last story. The next thing I want you to notice, people fully devoted to God are contagious. People fully devoted to God are contagious. Their zeal spreads to other people. Look what King Asa did when those people from the other tribes joined in with him. He was zealous and radical for the Lord. Reading in verse 14, 
So, so King Asa is zealous and radical. He's removed all the high places. He's restored the worship of God. He's repaired the altar. And then, and then the, all of Judah comes out, all of Benjamin come out, and then Ephraim, Manasseh, Simeon come out, all of these tribes. And, and look at verse 14. They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. You see, Asa's wholeheartedness is spread. Now, all of them, man, we want to get behind the true God of Israel. And then the Bible says this, they sought God eagerly and he was found by them. You may want to mark that in your Bible. Verse 15, they sought God eagerly and he was found by them. And then, so the Lord gave them rest on every side. So now they're getting wholehearted for the Lord. Asa's enthusiasm was contagious. Others were beginning to be infected with zeal for God. Folks, donuts are important. Don't get me wrong. Donuts are important. Great music's important. Don't get me wrong. But if we learn to be a worshiping church, we won't be able to keep people away from South Maine and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The next thing I want you to notice is this. People fully devoted to God are not just occasional or seasonal believers. People fully devoted to God are not just occasional believers, not just seasonal believers. Have you ever heard of a Sunday morning Christian? You know that term, don't you? That's that person who's only a believer at certain times, certain seasons, certain situations. For example, some come to church on Sunday and look like saints. But on the other days of the week, a saint he ain't. But on Sunday morning, they really look the part, dress the part, act the part. They know all the hymns, all the prayers. But these seasonal Christians, they're just Sunday morning Christians. Folks, these seasonal Christians are killing us. Their hypocrisy is killing us. These Sunday morning Christians or these other Christians that are only Christians when things are good or these other Christians that are only Christians when things turn bad. Folks, these seasonal Christians are killing us. They're killing the church with their hypocrisy. King Asa was full time for the Lord all the time. Even when things were hard. I mean, look at what he had to do in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16, a verse I read earlier in this message. King Asa also deposed his grandmother, Mayaka, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah, a false god. Asa cut it down, broke it up, burned it in the Kidron Valley. And although he did not remove all the high places from Israel, he did leave some work undone. The Bible says Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. Remember that, all his life. He wasn't just an occasional believer, all his life. Guys, imagine how, how hard it must have been to basically fire your grandmother. To basically fire your grandmother from her position as queen mother, but he did it because with all his life, he was fully committed to the Lord. So follow this example of King Asa. Quit being a seasonal Christian and be full-time, overtime, all-time for Jesus Christ. Here's something else I want you to notice about wholehearted people. It's it's a warning. People fully devoted to God can still be sidetracked. And that happened in King Asa's life. We see it in 1 Chronicles 16 that bitterness and anger got into Asa's life and it affected him. Folks, beware of bitterness. Don't let that root of bitterness grow in your life. Don't let anger take hold in your life because even a wholehearted Christian, if you don't watch out, it can sidetrack you. In uh, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 1, we read that Asa became lackadaisical in his spiritual life and devotion and then then angry when somebody tried to point that out and and the reason is Baasha the king of the northern kingdom of Israel began to threaten King Asa the southern kingdom of Israel Judah and so King Baasha uh, Baasha in verse 1 is going up against Judah and fortifying his cities and 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 he's going to start um, now Asa can tell he's going to pretty much attack and and lay siege to the to the, to the kingdom of Judah. So what's Asa going to do? 
Well, remember when Zerah the Cushite threatened, he just said, Lord, you're greater than these mere mortals, remember? But this time, I don't know, he became lackadaisical in his spiritual life. So he basically takes the church treasury, he robs the church funds, he takes the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple, and he takes them up to a neighboring king, this idolatrous king Ben-Hadad from Aram, present-day Syria, Damascus. And he says, hey, let's let there be a treaty between you and me. And I'm sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with King Baasha and come over to my side. Ben-Hadad agreed, took the gold and silver and, um, and, uh, and, and conquered I, John, Dan, uh, Dan Abel, Maimon, and uh, the Sitzor cities of Naph Naphtali. And so he begins to attack Israel. When Baasha heard that, he stopped building Ramah and abandoned his work and King Asa brought all the men of Judah. They carried away from Ramah all the stores and the stones and the timber. And, 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 and he, made this, he made this pact with the neighboring nation. He robbed the church treasury and paid him off. All right. There's a prophet that comes to him in verse 7. Hanani the seer. Hanani the seer comes to Asa, king of Judah, and says to him, Because you relied upon the king of Aram... And not on the Lord your God. The army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. And then he reminds him of the Cushites. Were not the Cushites and Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. And then this famous verse, Second Chronicles 16, 9, another great verse to mark in your Bible. Hanani the seer says to King Asa, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I want to read that again. He said, you made this, you made this, this treaty with a, with a foreign king. Remember Zerah the Cushite? You prayed and God delivered you. But you made this treaty with a foreign king and now the eyes of the Lord are just ranging throughout the earth to just find someone whose heart is fully committed to him. You've done a foolish thing. And verse 10, Asa becomes angry with the prophet. He didn't repent like, da like Daniel did when Nathan came. He becomes angry with the Lord. And because of this, he was so enraged that he put him in prison. And then at the same time, Asa began to brutally oppress some of the people. Then skipping to verse 12, in the 39th year of the reign of King Asa, he was afflicted with a disease in his feet. And because the disease was severe, look at this. Even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Then in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. So Asa didn't finish as well as he could have. Because even people fully devoted to God, if bitterness and anger take hold in their life, it can sidetrack them. Folks, beware of anger and that root of bitterness described in Hebrews 12, 5 that springs up and causes trouble and defiles yourself and other people. Bitterness can even sidetrack people who are fully devoted to the Lord unless they are careful and prayerful and peaceful. The bottom line is this. When God gives you an opportunity, work and serve. Work and serve. When God doesn't give you an opportunity, trust and pray. But be wholehearted from the Lord. God's word says it this way in Ecclesiastes 9. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Because God blesses those who go after God with their whole heart. Let us pray. Let us pray. I, I, this is going to be a very short time of prayer. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want to read you that verse, 2 Chronicles 16, 9 again. And then I want you to just indicate something by the raised hand. And then we're going to dismiss and we're going to leave from this place. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says this. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. While your heads are bowed and while your eyes are closed, the eyes of the Lord are looking, looking, 
looking for somebody, anybody, who will be fully committed to him. Will you be that person, that man, that woman, that young people, that young person who says this, yes. When your eyes fall on me, your eyes are going to fall on somebody who wants to be wholehearted for you. Not perfect, but wholehearted. Not perfect, but in the game. Not perfect, but going hard after the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be that person who is wholehearted for Jesus. If that's your prayer, would you just raise your hand and put it right back down? Man, mine goes up with you. Lord Jesus, help us to be full-hearted, wholehearted, full-time, all-time, all-in for Jesus. And we know that you will strengthen the hearts of those who are fully devoted to you. And now as we go from this place, Lord Jesus, I pray that you will help us to love you, to honor you, to serve you all the days of our life. And remind us when we leave this place that the service doesn't end. It begins when we walk out these doors. Help us to serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.